Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we will see about authorship of technical work. Who qualifies to be an author and who is not? Firstly, who qualifies to be an author? An author of a technical work is one who has made a significant intellectual contribution. So, what is intellectual contribution? It means somebody who has contributed significantly in the planning of the work, in the execution of the work or after the work is completed in the analysis of the results. Usually only writing does not qualify, because most of the intellectual contribution is there in the planning, execution and analysis. It is expected that all the authors participate in the writing. There could be some authors who just provide broad ideas, but that usually does not qualify, because ideas are free for anybody to guess. It is just floating around, you meet somebody, somebody suggests an idea, but how to plan that idea, how to execute it, how to analyze it is the real intellectual contribution idea is at best a guess. Another important characteristic of how to identify an author is that the author should own responsibility for at least one of these intellectual contributions. If something goes wrong in the analysis, some author is responsible. If something goes wrong in the execution, some other author is example and so on. There are some publications which require explicit identification of which author has contributed for what, but most journals do not have this. There could be some least significant authors such as somebody who just help type in the draft or carry out other uh, clerical work. It is important to have them, but only in the acknowledgement section they do not an author is one who contributes to the intellectual part and not just the clerical part. For example, the idea proposer or somebody with whom you have had helpful discussions. Some people might have given you manuscript comments, all of them need to be acknowledged, but not with an authorship. Now, let us look at what is bad authorship and who normally does not qualify to be called an author. Some bad authorships are as follows, gift authorship. So, gift authorship is something that you do as a personal favor. You include somebody else's name and somebody else includes your name for what you have not done. Now, that increases your publication count and your other author's publication count, but that is not an acceptable behavior. Similarly, an honorary author, an honorary author does not make any contribution, but maybe that person is very well known in the field and we might have an inclination that if that person's name is there, we could get it published easily. It could be an expression of gratitude to seniors institution, department heads, directors, principals and so on. All this is considered a bad practice. Now, there could be some other authors who are just there for not having done any in significant intellectual contribution. Now, there is an exactly opposite thing that is also possible called as ghost authors. Ghost authors who have actually contributed for an intellectual part of the work, but have not been credited. They could be just rented to do some work, hired to do some experiments, but they are not contributed. That again is a bad practice. And finally, having authors on a paper without their consent, oral or written is again a bad practice. It is important that all the authors in the paper 
know that they are being cited as an author to the paper. How do we determine the order of authorship? Now, this is widely varying and different disciplines, different groups have their own customs and practices. One possible order is a descending order of intellectual contribution. Now, who decides this? It is up to the group to decide. The another possibility is to have the lead author or the communicating author as the last and the rest of them in descending order of intellectual contribution. This is the most commonly found pattern of authorship. Some groups also use alphabetical or random. Here are some guidelines for best practices. All the authors sit together and decide which pattern they are going to follow. They could use any one of them, but they decide it together. Now, each one possibility to do that is to ask each author to state independently what they think the order should be and the reason why. And then all the authors exchange notes and decide and on the final criteria or the order. It may also be a good idea to state in the manuscript the reason behind choosing the order. This is important because the readers or people who are using to evaluate the authors will know what a particular author has actually contributed. Another bad practice to avoid is to use by default the supervisor of the work as the first author. It is not uncommon among various universities here to use the supervisor as the first author. It might be justifiable in certain cases, but usually that is not considered a good practice. Again some broad guidelines finally. Each department, lab or university needs to develop their own internal rules. All the authors have to agree in writing before the commencement of work on the particular order or criteria they are going to follow, who qualifies and in what order. Now, the changes to this principles must be made in due course only if there is a substantial change in the nature of the work. Here are some two thumb rules. You could use one of these two, at least one criteria. At least one means the author should have contributed to at least one of planning, execution and analysis. Another practice which is also recommended by most universities is all compulsory criteria in which the author should have contributed for one of planning, execution or analysis and one of drafting, reviewing or rewriting the intellectual content and very importantly all the authors must give a final approval of the manuscript. Thank you for listening.